Many of you have probably experienced those few minutes of sitting in an airplane on the runway, waiting for takeoff, annoyed and wondering, what is taking them so long? It's our turn, the runway is clear and we're still not moving. For comparison, a Nimitz-class carrier can launch one aircraft every 20 to 30 seconds from its four catapults. So why can't our airports do better? Those two to three minutes of wait in between takeoffs is to guarantee your safety. As an airplane passes through the air, a disturbance forms behind it known as wake turbulence. Wake turbulence has two major components, jet wash and wingtip vortices. Jet wash is the rapidly moving gas that's expelled by the jet engines. It's extremely powerful and hazardous. Jet wash can easily flip cars. The good thing is that the effect of jet wash is relatively short-lived. On average, jet wash is experienced up to 400 feet with the exception of takeoff thrust, which can extend to 1900 feet behind the aircraft. But on the other hand, wingtip vortices are the primary and the most dangerous component of wake turbulence. They are disturbances that occur as a result of the wing generating lift and can remain in the air for up to 3 minutes and stretch up to 10 miles. Aircraft wings generate a pair of vortices that rotate in opposite directions and sink about 290 to 490 feet per minute. They are not true turbulence, but still are incredibly dangerous, because if one aircraft enters the wake of a larger aircraft, it can lose its roll control due to the rotating vortex, resulting in a flip-over and crash. The strength of the wingtip vortices depends on the speed, wing shape and the weight of the aircraft. Altitude also plays a factor, as the strongest vortices form below 2,000 feet. So you can see how wake turbulence presents a huge hazard for aircraft during takeoff and landing. Over the years, wake turbulence caused numerous accidents, taking away hulls and lives. But it took this next incident for the officials to finally take some action. On May 30, 1972, a DC-9 aircraft was performing touch-and-go landings behind a larger DC-10 aircraft when it encountered wake turbulence, rolled 90 degrees and crashed into the runway. During the follow-up investigations, the National Transportation Safety Board conducted a series of wake vortex tests using Lockheed L-1011 and DC-10 aircraft. A colored smoke was emitted from a tower, and observations of the smoke after the aircraft flew by the tower gave the team insights about the length of time that vortices would remain in the air after the aircraft had flown by. It's worth noting that not only you can see wingtip vortices, but sometimes you can also hear them as rustling and cracking sounds. As a result of these experiments, the FAA developed minimum separation standards that take into account the effect of wingtip vortices from a departed aircraft onto the one that's departing after. Under these rules, airplanes were to be classified into light, medium and heavy depending on the weight of the aircraft. Later on, a superclass was also added to the categories on an interim basis for the Airbus A380 and Antonov AN225. While classified as a medium, the Boeing B-757 has special wake turbulence separation criteria after numerous incidents of smaller aircraft losing control when following a B-757. During takeoffs, an aircraft of a lower weight category has to wait at least two minutes before flying after an aircraft of a higher weight category. If the following aircraft does not start its takeoff roll from the same location as the preceding aircraft, the wait interval is increased to 3 minutes to ensure the wake turbulence has dissipated. During landings, the weight category of the preceding airplane and the following airplane determine the minimum separation distance. For example, if a light aircraft is landing after a super, the minimum distance between the two aircraft should be 8 nautical miles. But if a light aircraft wants to land after a medium aircraft, the minimum separation distance is just 4 nautical miles. Both minimum time and minimum distance separations can severely limit the throughput of an airport and result in delays and traffic jams. What we just discussed were the rules in the United States, but not all countries follow the exact same rules. For instance, in Dubai, an Airbus A380 is not part of a special category like it is in the US because it would severely impact the Dubai airport's efficiency. 
so the double-decker is just treated like any other heavy aircraft in most situations. Safety second, I suppose. Air traffic controllers are legally responsible for making sure there is sufficient time and distance separation between aircraft before giving them clearance to take off or land. But on busy days, they often have to lead clearances or cheat. In other words, they assume that preceding aircraft will be out of the way and have sufficient separation before giving clearance to the following aircraft. But by doing that, air traffic controllers do not really break regulations. They account for things like spooling up the engines before the aircraft actually moves. This technique only saves a few seconds, but over the course of a day, it adds up significantly. In order to increase airport efficiency, in 2012, FAA began a pilot project of testing revised criteria which relied on a six-category system instead of the previous four-category system. This new system takes into account not only the weight of an aircraft, but also the approach speed and wing configuration. The pilot project was implemented in Memphis, Tennessee, and resulted in 15% increased capacity of the airport's daily takeoff and landings due to reduced minimum separations under the new system. This new system is currently implemented in more than a dozen airports across the United States. If what we discussed so far made you more scared of flying, then you may want to skip this next part. Can wake turbulence flip airplanes mid-flight? In March of 2017, while a Challenger 604 was mid-flight, an Airbus A380 was traveling a thousand feet above the Challenger, but in the opposite direction. 48 seconds after the two crossed paths, at a distance of 15 nautical miles from the Airbus A380, the Challenger encountered severe wake turbulence that rolled the aircraft three to five times and flamed out both of its engines. The Challenger 604 lost 10,000 feet in altitude before the crew was able to bring the aircraft under control. Due to the extreme G-forces experience, the aircraft was damaged beyond repair and was written off. As a result of this incident, there is now a worldwide concern regarding the wake effects of the Airbus A380. It's always the little guy that gets hurt. Finally, let's go back to the aircraft carriers for a moment. While the width of a flight deck is roughly equivalent to the width of an airport runway, the airplanes that are launched from a carrier are much smaller. In addition, the carrier launch airplanes are also usually of similar size, which means the wake turbulence is less impactful. Also keep in mind that the carrier is traveling into the wind, which in turn reduces the wake turbulence. And last but not least, the jet aircraft that take off from the carrier perform a clearing turn to the right of the bow and to the left of the waist catapults. This allows for nearly simultaneous launching of two aircraft. However, if the aircraft climbs straight ahead, a minimum interval of 30 seconds between aircraft launches is needed. The moral of this story is, the bigger you are, the harder they fall.